Our first speaker for the afternoon session is Joe McGuire, who comes to us from Colorado. Please welcome Ms. McGuire, everybody, with a round of applause. Good afternoon. I have a disclaimer up front, and that is um, standing behind a microphone and not walking around will severely disable me from being able to think clearly. <laughs> so I, I'm usually pacing back and forth, so I apologize if I am and not very animated. I'm going to try to behave so that you can hear me. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right, I am going to do, in light of all of the wonderful science that we've heard this morning, I'm going to do a very scientific survey right now. Um, how many of you are business owners in this room? Please raise your hand. Business owners. Raise them up, raise them up, raise them up. Okay. How many of you are managers of people? Raise your hands. You manage people. Okay. How many of you work? How many of you? Okay. All right. So. What, what I want you to understand is that my presentation today has an impact on each and every one of you um, because you are all in a workplace or you have employees or you work with people or you deal with the public. And that's really what we're talking about here today. We're talking about workplace implications. My background is drug and alcohol testing primarily for employers. Drug and alcohol testing where, where I come from also includes young people, um, school disciplinary cases, um, people in rehab, court systems. But the number one client that we had in our business where I worked is the workplace, um, primarily because of Department of Transportation guidelines. How many of you are familiar with DOT employees who are mandated to do drug testing? Raise your hand. Thank you, another scientific survey. Right, um, so what that means for those of you who don't know about DOT, Department of Transportation has mandatory guidelines for um, truck drivers and airline pilots and train engineers. Aren't we happy about that? Yes, okay. So those are considered safety sensitive employees who must have, must have pre-employment drug test, post-accident drug test, random drug testing, um, and what we call return to duty and follow-up. We also have reasonable suspicion or for cause testing. Um, and, and so those are required. Now, there are definitions according to those federal guidelines on who qualifies to undergo that testing. Um, it's been a surprise to me to learn in the field of drug and alcohol testing that there are whole career fields that do not qualify as safety sensitive. For instance, mining. How many of you have ever been out to a mine, um, an active like industrial mine and seen the vehicles that are easily, you know, like a third size of this room? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. I had my picture taken in front of one and it's like a two-story apartment building. I mean, it's, these vehicles are huge. Um, the drivers of those vehicles, not subject to mandatory drug testing. Why? Because most mining operations take place on private property. The company owns it. They have huge drug and alcohol problems in the mining industry. Let's not even start going into the guys that are underground and working with chemicals and refining and all that. They don't qualify for the federal drug testing program, as do not the majority of you or your employees. So then what is our recourse for what our government has given us in the form of safe and drug-free workplace. We have wonderful guidelines for safe and drug-free workplace that assure me as an employee that I am allowed, I have the right to come to work in a safe environment and not be put at risk by my coworker who may be a, either a chronic user of a drug or under the influence of some type of medication, alcohol, or some other substance that causes some type of impairment. So the federal government has said, I have that right, and employees um, have the right to advocate for that themselves, and employers have the right to enforce that and to structure it, to set it up in their company. Um, these things can go in, hand in hand with OSHA compliance and that type of thing. However, what we don't have in, in this regard is any type of enforcement. We have no type of enforcement. So there's DOT guidelines that are mandatory for the, the employees that qualify, and then there's everyone else. And the rest of us have 
nothing. We have some really good suggestions. We have some strong encouragements, but we don't have anything that can be enforced outside of voluntary enforcement that good companies would put into place. However, we know that we have a drug problem in our country, as we've been hearing about this morning, um, and it's, it's becoming greater. And think about the fact that those drug problems are impacting our employees. Now, we, we have some um, specific numbers on this, and I want you to see. 9% um, of full-time employees, I'm sorry, I'm getting away from the microphone. You gotta watch me, guys. You can say, we can't hear you, okay. 9% of full-time employees will say, you know, I, I have a drug problem. And then more for part-time employees, as you can see. What does that mean? Okay, you go, well, you know what, so it's 9%, whatever. If you have a small business and you have 10 employees, statistically, you've got a person with a problem. Think about that. If you have a few hundred employees, you have a chunk of people who, who admit to using regular if you go by statistics. And I will always say that statistics are statistics for a reason because they turn out to be categorically true across the board when, when we look at overwhelming data. So the more employees that you have, the more likely you are to have people who have a regular drug problem. According to the Quest Diagnostics Drug Test Index um, in 2013, this is the increase in positive drug tests for marijuana use amongst employees in both Colorado and Washington. Colorado went up 20%, uh, and positives in Washington, 23%, not, not went up, had 20% and 23% positive marijuana tests in the workplace over the rest of the nation. Um, this year at, at the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Conference nationally, we actually do that, we have a conference, can you believe that? Like, it's a real thing. Um, but drug and alcohol testers around the nation come together and we get the latest on data and toxicology and work with the labs and see all the newest, latest, greatest, um, you know, testing methods and that type of thing. And so Quest started tracking this data several years ago. And uh, one of the concerns that was released this year for 2014 is that since Colorado and Washington legalized marijuana in 2012, 2014 showed us the first increases in workplace positives in all illicit drugs in well over a decade, with marijuana being the highest. Cocaine went up, heroin went up, PCP went up, PCP. Well, you know, when I first got into drug and alcohol testing, I said, is that seriously even a thing anymore? Um, but it remains on the DOT drug panel because it is um, frequently used on the East Coast. And so it, it remains on the drug panel. Increase in all illicit drugs in the United States in two years following legalization. This is not a trend that, that we want to continue, but this is what is happening right now. Um, surprising statistics um, reported by, self-reported by people in the workplace. Um, here, th these ones right here pertain more to work comp outcomes, but 55% more accidents in the workplace um, w with drug users, 62% uh, uh, more injuries, greater absenteeism, loss of productivity. These are things that one of my greatest concerns that I have in, um, in working with employers, and so let me just back up and explain a little bit about my role. Um, I was not just in alcohol and, and drug testing. I became a trainer for testers. So I had to, um, I became a LifeLock certified technician to train people who do breath alcohol machines. So I had to learn all of the science behind that and go through certification. And then um, a, a trainer for people who do drug collections, so learning all that methodology. And then I started managing compliance programs for DOT employers. So if you had um, employees who qualify as safety sensitive, I could be a third party administrator, manage your program, and you know, run that for you and make sure that you were audit compliant. So what I started seeing from employers, large companies who 
who really come under scrutiny, and they tend to be the ones who get targeted by the auditors, the FAA and the FTA and the FMCSA auditors on a regular basis, they get this. They understand the loss of productivity, the absenteeism, they under, because they're keeping their numbers. They have, they have an office person who does that full time, typically. Um, so a lot of these companies will even have their own people that they hire on site to do their drug testing for them, so they get this. But who gets hit the hardest? The small business owner. And you know, I, I just have to tell you, what I've seen in Colorado, I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I've lived there for um, nearly 27 years. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Denver native, raised my family in Colorado, my three children, and to, to understand the makeup of the state of Colorado is to understand that the small business owner is the heart of our state. And I suspect the heart of your state too, and the heart truly of America. What makes our heart beat here is the dream, the American dream that I, one of these days I wanna be a business owner and, and I want to, you know, do something that's my passion and make a difference. So you do that. Let, let's say, you know, your passion is, uh, some people in Colorado, it's, you know, fly fishing. That's one of our big things. So I'm gonna have a fly fishing shop and go into sporting goods and all that. What does that have to do with anything? What it has to do with is, if you get the right location, 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 right? And you're on your way up to the mountain communities and the tourists come through this part of the community uh, on their way to the mountains, oh, and they see the fly fishing shop, and so they're stopping, and you become successful, and now you have six employees, and, and now you have 12, and now you have two locations and 20 people, and you just happen to be on that little piece of Highway 24 right there that, that just touches Manitou Springs as you go up to the mountains where retail sales became legal and allowable, and so now your employees start dipping into the retail marijuana for recreational use. And so all of a sudden, you've got a drug problem, your customers aren't getting served, uh, you're losing money, money's coming in like crazy, business is great, but you can't figure out why the books aren't adding up, something's going down, and you've got to st take a step back and assess. Now we're having huge absenteeism in the workplace, we can't replace these people. Now I, as the business owner, am having to stand behind the cash register half the time because my people are gone or sick or whatever's going on. I'm seeing this all the time. Business owners say, I don't know what's happening. I can't find good people and I don't know why. That business owner does not have the ability, the capability, the knowledge, the understanding, or the capacity on any level to sit back and recognize how drug use is impacting their workplace. So the money is bleeding out the back, the, the business is suffering, and they're just trying to wear all these hats and keep it going. When you end up having the losses um, and, and when you end up having the risks, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, this is where business owners really need to understand um, what can actually be happening and take a step back and recognize um, drug use. The costs that we are seeing of substance use in the workplace are absolutely astronomical in the U.S. Um, it, and one of the things that is deeply concerning to me is that the studies that we have on this, the numbers that you see, all of the statistics that you're going to see with the exception of the Quest Diagnostics Drug Test Index, um, many of them are a decade old or more because we have relied on um, SAMHSA and, and DOT for these types of stats. One study was done by the U.S. Coast Guard um, several years ago, and we're not keeping up on them. We don't have the money, we don't have the ability to continue to repeat these studies, so I think the costs are even greater now than ever before because drug use is higher, but we're relying on old data, and, and we admit that, um, but that's what we've got. I hear people all the time say, uh, Joe, if the federal government will reschedule marijuana or deschedule marijuana, we won't have this problem. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I do when I talk to employers is I just give a very brief explanation of why is marijuana schedule one, what does that mean, and will it impact the workplace if it's descheduled or rescheduled? The bottom line is 
marijuana meets all of the criteria for being Schedule One. That's been repeatedly proven across the board. Um, and, and from the, the evidence that you've heard this morning, I, I won't get into repeating all of that, but you've heard it this morning over and over again that it continues to meet the criteria for Schedule One. So we deschedule it. Okay, uh, other drugs that we test for and are not allowed in the workplace are also not Schedule One. All right? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Schedule Two. It doesn't matter if it's descheduled. It is still an impairing substance. Um, so alcohol is not a Schedule One substance. Can you come to work drunk? No. Can you test for alcohol? Yes. I hear some very quiet yeses. You're all tired now because of your big lunch. Okay, let's try again. Can you test for alcohol impairment in the workplace? Yes. Why would you think that because marijuana legalization um, is given the appearance of sweeping the nation, I'll, I'll give you it's popular, I don't think it's a bullet train as we're being led to believe that it is. Um, it's just being crammed down our throats. But, um, you know, it, why would you think that you have to remove marijuana from a drug panel because it's popular now? Would you do that with alcohol? And when I say this to employers, they go, oh my gosh, I never really thought of it that way. I'm going to tell you, um, I, I spend a lot of my time these days saying things that would seem to be common sense to us all. And you go, wow, Joe, are you seriously making a living telling me stuff I already know? Um, the answer is yes. But I want to tell you that one of the reasons for that is, folks, I have been asked to come in and train um, human resource supervisors on what you can do about legal marijuana and enforcing your drug policy, right? And I will have a room half the size of human resource professionals. And I will say something to the effect of, if you suspect that someone is high or impaired or under the influence on the job, um, never ever let them drive to the drug testing facility. Please put them in a car and drive them yourself or have the drug tester come to the facility um, for your own liability. And you cannot believe the number of times people in the room will go, Oh my God, I never thought of that. <laughs> and, and my response in my head is, oh my God, I can't believe you never thought of that. I mean, <laughs> because, but, but I believe that one of the reasons that I have to come and say these common sense things is because employers are being bullied and intimidated by people who use this substance into backing down and doubting themselves and being flat out scared to enforce good sound policy. And so that's why I'm here. Um, so if, if you have a problem with that, you could you know, talk to the organizers, it's not my fault. <laughs> so, um, but reschedule, deschedule marijuana, it doesn't matter. People cannot come to work high, it is not safe. People cannot come to work under the influence, it is not safe. It is not safe for them, it's not safe for the fellow co-worker, it's not safe for the supervisor, it's not safe for the public, and it is not safe for your liability should an accident or injury occur um, where, where there's significant injury, treatment needed, or even death, which does happen. Okay. Um, dependent syndrome, Dr. Thurston has covered that. Signs of physiological addiction, I'm not going to um, reiterate this at length. One of the things, though, that, that I do when I talk to workplace is I, I talk to employers about the fact that this is not just harmless. This is not like tobacco use because people really do not understand the implications of that. And so we'll talk about um, what all that means. We also will talk about medical marijuana. Well, Joe, it, you know, if it's medicine, you have to let people have their medicine. You can't keep them from it. None of the major, and this is a, a very brief snapshot, none of the major medical organizations in this country endorse marijuana for medical use, none. And so I'll give this brief snapshot and say, okay, um, the term medical marijuana is a misnomer, all right? That is being used to change cultural norm, to desensitize us, and to get us to buy into thinking of marijuana as medicine. So um, some of us will have a tendency when we're talking in circles um, to say marijuana for medical, medical excuse because there is no legitimate accepted medical use for marijuana yet, but even when we repeat the words medical marijuana, we're contributing to the norming, 
all right? So, uh, you know, we can talk about what does your workplace policy look like and how do you incorporate that and what do you do, um, knowing that I strongly personally will advocate against making a medical marijuana allowance because it is not a good practice for your own personal liability. And we've seen lawsuits that indicate exactly that. Um, however, if someone is totally committed to that, you know, you need to define that very carefully and put some really big boundaries around it because what's going to happen is um, people are going to come and push it harder and harder and harder. Um, today's marijuana, you've heard about the potency. You've heard about that over and over again this morning. And I cannot stress to you, let, let me just give you a, a little snapshot of what that looks like in the drug and alcohol testing industry. When I started my job, we would see young people come in and maybe have like, if they were really um, heavy users in my estimation, they would have probably between 50 nanograms of marijuana. Sometimes like we would be freaked out. We saw a kid that came in with 150, like, well, he was actually like 155 nanograms and we're like, oh my gosh, this kid is using so much pot. And we're concerned and we talked to the mom and we set him down and um, you know, have these serious conversations. Now, I know that you heard this morning the, the legal limit for driving is five nanograms in Colorado. Um, that's, that's a per se limit, and, and Jim Gerhardt, can, are you gonna speak to that at all when you're talking? No, you're not getting into that, okay. So it's a per se limit, and it's blood. THC, it's whole blood. That's different from what I'm talking about. I'm typically talking about your analysis. We can talk some more fluids, some hair, or whatnot, but workplace doesn't utilize blood testing. Um, normally, so it's a completely different measurement. We're talking about the active parent drug over here in driving versus your analysis and whatnot. Um, and we don't have any direct comparisons or correlations between any of the fluids. So you ask me, well, this drug test came out to be this, what does it mean in that? We, the, the labs are so far beyond understanding those correlations yet, we, we, it's not comparing apples to oranges, it's like apples to golf balls. Okay, so it, we're really way, way behind the science on even understanding what that looks like. Um, but we, we do have DOT standards. If you have a 50 nanogram um, amount of marijuana on the first screen of a urinalysis, it gets, it, it gets set aside and then it runs through a completely different process to test and see what your nanogram levels are. 15 nanograms or over on a urinalysis are considered a positive drug screen, end of subject. 15 or less, we can't rule out various indicators for secondhand exposure or whatever, and so we consider it a negative, all right? Um, so we, we'd have these kids, 75, 150. I mean, the majority of the time, they really test at 25 or 30, but when you have the kids that we go, this is a problem, that's where they'd be. Immediately after passing Amendment 64, and I don't mean on January 1st when we enacted the law, I mean after the vote, okay? within a week, we started seeing kids from our local schools coming in and testing at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 nanograms. So we're trying to gauge, and these parents are freaking out and saying, okay, what does this mean? Well, you know what? We don't know. Does that mean now they're smoking every hour instead of every day? Does it mean the potency has, has rapidly gone up? The interesting thing about our potency increases is this has not just slowly evolved over these last three years. This was an overnight change, an overnight change. Ask any of us here from Colorado, we just went, wow, they had some stuff waiting in the wings um, because we just saw this explosion. And so is it the potencies, is it the dabbing? I was at Lakewood High School last Wednesday meeting with the assistant principals and the deans, and they said, you've got to get down here, you've got to talk to these kids and do something. Our freshmen are going out and hitting dabs on lunch and they get a, a buck a dab, a buck a dab. Um, I sat in a Colorado Department of Public Health update last summer where a ganjapreneur who owns a marijuana shop in downtown Denver explained to our Department of Public Health officials that Dabbing saves time for regular marijuana users because one hit of dabs is equal to 26 joints. And so it, it's just a time saver, people. I don't know why you're upset. Come on. I mean, 
So now what, you, and, and what they said was dabbing is not for marijuana naive users, it's for the regular person who's built up the tolerance and can handle it. And one year later, I go to our high school and our freshmen are dabbing down the street for a buck at lunch. We got a problem. And I am here to talk about workplace, but I'm also here as a citizen. I'm also here as a mom of a kid who has an addiction problem. I'm also here as a colleague of these wonderful people that you've heard from this morning and, and tell and hear their stories on a regular basis. So I'm here to say to you, Arizona, don't do what Colorado has done. Not for the sake of our children. Um, but let's get back to workplace. So you saw Chris Thurstone talk about the vaporizers, um, the vape pens. Uh, so these cartridges that you see next to the vape pens here are THC cartridges. You have Indica, Sativa, and then you have a blend, um, a hybrid blend. So workplace, think about this. Put this in the context of um, how many of you have a coworker or an employee who uses a vape pen they're trying to quit smoking? Let me see. Okay. So how do you know if there's a THC cartridge in that pen? You don't, because you know what? You don't get the same smell that you do if someone's toking, all right? Um, some, it, w when these first came out, you could smell, especially if you got close, but they're getting better at these folks. And so you cannot tell the difference. And I've heard from employers over and over again who says, I don't know if I can outlaw vape pens on, on my property, but I swear they've got THC in those things and they're not just using the nicotine cartridges. Um, you, if you can have anti-smoking policies on campus, that can include your vaporizers in a workplace policy. And many campuses are starting to go to that, especially medical campuses, uh, because they're having this problem. Again, with the edibles, you've seen so many pictures of the edibles. But one of the things that is really frustrating uh, for us in Colorado, I, I live very close to Fort Carson Army Base. And they are telling me that one of the greatest problems on base are the contractors coming in to work on base and bringing all the, these pot products in their lunch boxes because nobody can tell. Uh, we have salsas, granolas, um, pretzels, snack mix, um, you name it. You, you cannot tell that that is what someone is ingesting sitting right next to you. Of course, we've talked about the dabs. But one of the things that I want to mention on... Um, really quickly to you is the comparison between alcohol and marijuana. Um, our bill was titled uh, Regulate Like Alcohol in Colorado. And that was a way of getting people to automatically go, sounds like a good idea, right? Um, aside from you know, one or two very surface comparisons, there are no clear direct correlations. Um, they are two very different substances. They behave very differently. People respond to them differently. But let me just talk from the context of someone who does um, drug and alcohol testing for safety-sensitive employees. So in alcohol, or let, let's just, let's step outside of the workplace and just talk about roadside, all right? So I am on uh, the El Paso County DUI Task Force in Colorado Springs. And so we have our drug recognition experts and our local law enforcement come in with these huge frustrations because they go, we have absolutely no standards of measurement um, for any kind of impairment that help us with roadside whatsoever. They don't exist. And if you hear that we're light years ahead and we figured this all out, that's a complete lie because we have figured out nothing. We have no methods for this. So here's what this looks like in Colorado. Someone's weaving, cop pulls them over, smells the pot billowing out of the car, but the first thing you gotta do is the breath alcohol test. You blow the breath alcohol test and it's zero, okay? The breath alcohol test captures breath from the lower third of the lung. That's where the breath to alcohol exchange is made. That's why if you've ever had to blow into one of those things, I won't take a survey on that. Um, that you have to blow for so long. I just emptied my lung of air to the capacity that I could without passing out. You're getting the lower third breath to alcohol exchange. We have learned over many years of trial and error and many deaths on roads that 
that measurement will tell us the exact ratio of alcohol in the brain right now. That's how much alcohol your brain is saturated with at that moment. So what happens with marijuana? Step over here. I have a friend, Barry Knott, of Life, LifeLock Technologies in Denver. He got a grant from the federal government to create a marijuana breath alcohol device. And everyone keeps saying, it's coming, it's imminent, it's out any minute. We're going to have it, and we're going to do this. So I go up to Barry, because I'm one of his trainers. And I said, Barry, tell me how it's going on your breath alcohol machine for marijuana. I want to know, you know, what's, the, what's this looking like? So he takes me out to lunch, and he's given me permission to share this. It sounds like a secret because I'm a good storyteller, but it's not really a secret. Um, although he does have federal money that he's got to figure out what to do with on this, but he says, I'm nowhere close. Nowhere close. Been working on it two years, not a clue. Got nothing for you. What he has been able to detect is a slight bit of residual um, oral fluid in the mouth and get something that's slightly sensitive to get an oral fluid sample, but it's oral fluid. That's not a breath exchange. In fact, marijuana doesn't exchange in the breath. That's not how this works. What does marijuana do? It hits the bloodstream and then it goes into the fat cells. So tell me, when Mr. Cop on the side of the road pulls over the person who's weaving, marijuana's billowing out of the car, the breath alcohol machine comes out zero, how do you take a fat measurement? What does that look like, right? But not only that, Someone who's heavier is going to metabolize differently than someone thinner. Someone who's using it more frequently is going to have a higher tolerance than someone who doesn't use. Someone who uses a strain of 15% is going to have a different reaction than someone who uses a strain of 80%. We don't understand differences in edibles. We don't understand differences in concentrates. We're measuring everything um, way back when on a 5% cigarette. Uh, you know, from decades ago, but we're not allowed to test the new stuff. So you're going to hear studies show, we got studies that are showing that, you know, no changes, but the, ask what the THC content of is in those studies. It's low THC, low grade THC. It's not the stuff we're dealing with now. We're not allowed to test that because it's schedule one. So we have a vicious cycle going on here right now. So in Colorado, you suspect something's wrong. Now, our law says you have to get a drug recognition expert on the scene. Cop can't do anything about it if he's not a drug recognition expert. So you gotta get a DRE out. And then we have to try to determine through, you know, these types of things, whether or not there's enough inferred impairment to do the drug test, or the blood test, all right? So by the time it takes the DRE to get there in traffic, in rural area, urban area, it doesn't matter. This is a challenge. Um, then they have to do a field sobriety test. Then they can determine that now we need a blood test. Now you have the challenge of figuring out where to go do that. Cops don't do blood tests roadside. So we have some rural areas that they have to cart these people off to a local jail because the jail is the only place where they draw blood. Some areas have people who are trying to, you know, come out with EMR and, and do it remotely. Sometimes you, you have to go to the local hospital. But the thing is, that THC, that parent blood, it, you can measure it really quickly after the use, and then it drops really rapidly. So you can get it right away, and then it goes down. So you have a window to get the actual impairment. So a lot of the tests that they're getting, by the time they get the person to this process, that whole, blood parent, that whole parent THC has dropped rapidly, and they're not able to get the correct measurement. But, you know, hey, we had a lady who tested at 21 nanograms of THC recently, 21. Five is our per se. But we also wrote into our law, because Colorado's doing this right, that you can challenge that. All right? What happened? She's a medical marijuana patient. Parentheses. Whenever you hear me say medical marijuana, I want you to think parentheses in your head. Parentheses. Um, she's a medical marijuana patient, and so she had a high tolerance. And so her attorney convinced the jury that she's not impaired, and the DRE can't prove impairment, because there's no impairment measurement. There's no standard for it. Tests don't matter. We don't really know what it looks like, and so she was acquitted and walked away clean. 21 nanograms. Now, we have studies from Europe that show maintaining one nanogram of THC in your brain causes impairment. But we're just tossing them out left and right. So, so then what happens when you're talking about establishing a precedence for having case law that will help law enforcement enforce traffic safety? We are blowing it to smithereens. My husband is in automobile insurance, and so we're constantly like strategizing around Colorado. What can we do? What can we do? What can help us? So I, you know, talking with friends, this brilliant idea. I go to my husband. You're in auto insurance. 
Help us understand how we can get the insurance companies to lay the smack down on Colorado and get us to come to our senses about safe driving. He goes, you're missing a really fundamental part of this problem. Insurance, the, the insurance um, industry in and of itself, they don't start changing things until court convictions go up. And we're getting all our cases tossed out, and so what it actually, Colorado has not yet shown that this is enough problem to do something about. So you think about with an employer. How, I, I get this question all the time. So this is one of the reasons for this slide. This is a question. We think now that it's legal, we should allow our employees to maintain some marijuana in their system. It's only fair. So we want to change our drug panel um, and raise the cutoff levels and let them maintain so much in their system. I say, okay, how much is that? Well, if any of you know a number and want to toss it out there to me, what sounds reasonable to you? Don't answer it because you're not experts. Okay. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you make fly fishing equipment for a living. What do you know about THC limits? But I get employers all the time who say, 30 sounds good. <laughs> okay, 30 sounds good. The DOT cutoff is 15, but all right. You're going to take a stab in the dark at 30, and what does that mean? We don't know. Um, but we have people who know nothing who are asking the labs to change the cutoff levels on the drug test for their employees because that's only fair having no idea the ramifications or the results that come from that. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for these very tiny slides, but all this is doing right here is just giving you an idea for the employer of the side effects, which you've heard plenty of those side effects today. What I'm trying to establish when I show these slides in the workplace are the side effects that we have um, are no longer what they used to be. It's no longer chilled, laid back, relaxed, so what? Um, they're the person who, basically, the Walmart greeter, dude, dude. That's not what this looks like these days. What this looks like is aggression, psychosis, psychotic breaks, hallucinatory behaviors, um, accidents and injuries, not to mention traffic crashes. I had an employer who called me from Houston, and he said, I own some stores in Colorado, and I want to change the... Um, as I just mentioned to you, I want to change the cutoff level on the drug test. I want you to help me write this into my policy. And I said, okay, what's your company? And he tells me. And um, I said, uh, so what are you thinking about your cutoff level? And he tells me, 50 nanograms. And I said, okay, and don't you have uh, delivery drivers with your company? And he said, um, yes, in fact, everybody is a driver. So you, everybody wears all the hats. You do the register, you do the driving, and you deliver. Okay, so you're going to let all these guys drive and you're going to allow them to have 50 nanograms in their system. I said, I won't write your policy. And he said, I think I'll rethink it. Um, but people are not, as I said, very smart, very smart people are rethinking things because they're intimidated. Um, in Colorado, our employment law is giving the impression of being very strong and sound and safe. Uh, so I've been asked to, to comment on that with frequency as I travel around. I actually was asked to um, be a part of the Governor's Task Force work group on banking, taxation, and civil law, civil law being employers' rights to drug test. And when I got to that work group, you will hear Colorado did this wonderfully collaborative thing. All these people came to the table and they agreed on these rules. We had 90 days, by the way, to create an entire regulatory system, which is utterly ridiculous. And uh, we didn't have anything to go from, so we laid it over our incredibly failed medical marijuana policies. So that's how we came to have this wonderful system that is, you know, being touted worldwide. And so, as the first day that we came together, we had some bankers and we had some attorneys and we had some people from Department of Revenue because, by the way, our oversight agency for Recreational marijuana in Colorado is not the Colorado Department of Public Health or Agriculture. It's the Department of Revenue. If that means anything to you at all, it means a lot to me. Um, and and then so there were you know there were a few of those folks around the table, and then the rest of our table and every regulatory table that that we worked with. Chris was on a table, and he can, he'll can he stand up here and say, Joe's a liar, Joe's telling the truth. I'll let Chris do that later. But, um, but all the rest of the people at the table were proponents for the marijuana industry, and they outweighed most of the time everyone else sitting at the table 
or at least were much louder. So the very first day that we were there and we went around the table and introduced ourselves, we started talking about taxation. We have to deal with how to create a tax scheme for this. Total nightmare, that's gonna take a long time. We have 90 days. Um, let's put that on the shelf because it's gonna be really, really hard and we need to get some experts here, some economists, and we gotta figure out what that's gonna look like. Number two, banking. Federally illegal, okay, next topic. Um, and this is how it went. Next topic, civil law. Okay, that's employer's right to test, so you know, let's tackle that one, that's pretty easy. The amendment says what it says, we all agree, we can go home today. Oh, wait a minute, the marijuana industry says, you need to stop right there. Now, I opened my mouth and started laying out my expertise on workplace drug testing, and one of the attorneys for the marijuana industry said to me, um, you are irrelevant, you can sit down and shut up. And that's how it went for me for 90 days. <laughs> the marijuana industry drove, drove this whole thing. And so this strong paragraph that we have in favor of employer's rights says an employer um, can restrict marijuana use. And the marijuana industry said restrict does not mean prohibit. And so what we had was all these smart people around the table whipping out their smartphones and going dictionary.com, webster.com, prohibit. Click definition restrict, restrict, prohibit. <laughs> They're synonymous, but the marijuana industry says no, they are not. So they say what you have to do is you have to learn who in your employee is allowed to be under the influence and who is not, um, because some people can. So one of the things that I throw out there to you as coworkers and as managers and as business owners and as we took the survey, people who work, who is it okay to be under the influence at work? Who is it okay? Who is it okay for? That's really a grammatically terrible sentence, but you know what I mean. Um, who is okay to come to work impaired? What, what do we want to do with that? As far as drug testing goes, I just want to say that all of the excuses that employees give for the reason their drug test comes up positive are null and void, and I can dispute all of them, so my cards are down here. Come talk to me. <laughs> and then I, I also want to say, that in all of the many cases that have gone to the courts on behalf of employers who fired an employee for having, a pot, for having marijuana in their system, where the employer, and this is so critical, please hear me, where the employer had a sound drug policy, had awareness of that policy amongst their employees, so they were educated, they talked about it, and enforced it regularly they have won those cases even in Colorado. California, Colorado, Minnesota, wherever those cases have gone up to the state Supreme Court has been ruled in favor of the employer when those things are in place. So you must have a sound policy, you must enforce it and you must educate uh, the people that, that you work with that that is what we do here. That's the environment you should create. Um, I, I believe it's your responsibility to society to keep your community safe. Um, one of the other things I just want to mention very briefly is if you already do this and you're going, I got it covered, you can sit down and one ear out the other, whatever. One of the things that I'm hearing that also concerns me is that employers are saying, um, we don't really like reasonable cause testing, so we're just going to call it a random. Do not. Do not, do not let the marijuana industry and the attorneys who are waiting for these cases to come through let you call a reasonable cause test, someone for a cause that you suspect of using drugs, a random when it is not a random test. And you can't prove it's random if you just test one person. So you call it what it is. And if you don't know how to do that, get training. There's tons of training out there. Again, I can help you find that. I have my cards down here. I'm more than happy to serve as a resource if you don't understand that. Um, so I think that is the gist of my program, except for one thing I will say. The future of this is that all boundaries will continue to be tested and pushed. I don't think this is an effort to regulate marijuana. I think this is an effort um, for, I personally um, have been calling it social anarchy. <laughs> we're not trying to control anything. And in Colorado, we're not trying to control it. We're trying to create a free-for-all situation where um, everybody will just accept that that's the way it is and deal with it. So um, I want to put in a plug for this Clearing the Hay series. 
Um, this is the Gazette of Colorado Springs has done a beautiful job. You're gonna hear a little bit more about this um, in the presentation by Christy um, Tatum Thurstone. In this series, and the reason I brought a few copies, but you can get the, get the copies of this online, there are workplace impact stories from employers who are telling what is happening in Colorado and, and saying it like it is. And folks, you really need to understand, right now, 75% uh, of employees are failing their drug test. Our employment pool is becoming so small, some companies are hiring from out of state, some employers are moving their businesses to other states because they just can't operate anymore. Arizona, please learn a lesson from us. Thank you.